Well, amen for the good old hymns. Take your Bible this evening and open up, please, to the book of Revelation. Put a little marker there and then find the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. The book of Daniel. We're going to begin in the book of Daniel in chapter 9. Give you just a moment to turn there. Daniel chapter 9. Soon after the rapture of the church, which many of us think can't be too far off from today, the tribulation will begin, but it'll begin with the signing of the seven-year peace treaty with Israel. Say, how do we know this? Because in Daniel chapter 9, if you look at it now, please look at verse 27. It says, and he, it's a reference to the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That is a reference to seven years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate. Now, some might wonder, how do we know that that week means seven years? By the context, beloved, you go back to verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. That's 69 weeks, 483 years. And literally from that point uh, of Daniel's prophecy, 483 years later, came the Lord Jesus and he was crucified. Verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. He was crucified. This is how we know. When the Bible says that uh, there are uh, one week or six weeks or seven weeks, we understand it to be literally that. Unless the context illustrates that it's something else. The prophets sometimes spoke prophetically. We have here the 70 weeks. And um, we come up to the 69th week and we have this break in time in Israel's calendar. And the last week is about to begin. Now with that, go to Revelation chapter 10. Remember, please, that Revelation, um, did I say 10? I meant 11. If I told you 10, I am mistaken. I am sorry. I meant to say chapter 11. We already dealt with chapter 10 last week. Chapter 10 through to chapter 11, verse 13 is parenthetical, meaning that it's not chronological in its description of events, but rather the events, the chronology stops at the end of chapter 9. We take a step back and now we start exploring some other themes and we learn some other truths and we are in this parenthetical section. Last week in chapter 10, we learned about the little book. Today or tonight, we will be looking at the two witnesses. So please remember that this is parenthetical. All right. We have for our subject study tonight, the two witnesses. And we'll be looking at um, uh, this uh, chapter 11 verses 1 to 13. Let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our dear, wonderful, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for things that transpire that we don't yet understand. Our Father, by faith, we lift up our hearts and give you glory and honor and worship and thanksgiving and obedience. Our Father, we ask that you would open the eyes of our understanding tonight. Help us to learn more and understand more as we read and study this wonderful book, particularly chapter 11, the first 13 verses. Holy Spirit of God, please be our teacher tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd bless all of your people tonight with an increase in faith. And I pray that if there be any watching this broadcast who has not yet receive the Lord Jesus Christ as his or her personal savior, you would show them their need to do so. And we'll thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Well, verse one of chapter 11, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So John is told here to measure the temple in Jerusalem. Please notice that there is 
going to be a temple in Jerusalem. Now, today, uh, in Jerusalem, the Muslim holy place called the Mosque of Omar or the Dome of the Rock sits on the site once occupied by Solomon's temple. Now, as we understand it, it's got to go in order for the temple to be rebuilt. Now, some have suggested that the uh, site on which Solomon's temple uh, was located is not the place in which the Dome of the Rock is located, but is actually ro located several hundred yards off to one side, an area easily accessible. Now, whether that's true or not, we don't know. Folks, there's so much we don't know. But one thing we do know is that there's going to be another temple in Jerusalem. That will happen. Nothing's going to change that. Now, whether it's going to be right where the Dome of the Rock is, or whether it's going to be off to one side, we don't know. We do know that the Jews over there have been collecting money for many years to, in order to build a temple. They've got construction plans. They've got all of their priests trained and in place. They've got all of the apparatus, everything they need. They just need the green light to go ahead. I think something catastrophic needs to happen <coughs> in order for uh, the Jews to rebuild their temple uh, where the Dome of the Rock sits. Because right now, that is um, controlled by the Muslims. So, a lot of people have speculated that there could be a mass conversion of, of Muslims over to the Catholics. The Pope and the Muslims have been getting together lately. But the bottom line is, we don't know. Um, we're not even sure why God told John to measure the temple. But at least it does introduce the idea of the temple in Jerusalem. And so verse 2. But the court which is without the temple. Leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall be tread underfoot. Forty and two months. That means three and a half years. Verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Here they are. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. That also means three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. And so uh, we're told months, we're told days. They both mean the same, three and a half years. It could have something to do with the uh, idea that the ministry of the two prophets uh, is going to be uh, taking hold of the world's attention like a co coronavirus has taken hold of the word, world's attention today. And that's all that's in the news. You open up the news, turn it on, and it's all about coronavirus. It could be that when the tribulation comes and these two uh, mighty prophets of God start speaking, that the news will carry them and what they're saying and what they're doing and what's happening every single day. That's only a thought. We don't know. But these two witnesses shall come and they shall prophesy. Now these are men. These, these two witnesses do not represent all of the saved people as some try to make it say. Uh, they're, they're not using the literal method. These are two actual men, two literal human beings because they live, they speak, they are martyred and they are resurrected. Their preaching ministry will actually torment people on earth. If you look at verse 10, it says... Uh, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. Watch this. And shall send gifts to one another. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And so the ministry of these two prophets, whoever they might be, is going to have a worldwide effect. And uh, very likely the news will be carrying uh, daily events of what's happening with these, these two uh, prophets when they come and start ministering. Some, however, have tried to say that it's not two literal men. It represents all of the saved people all over the world. I don't believe it. Some say it doesn't mean that. It represents law and represents grace. I don't believe that at all. Uh, I do believe that they are humans, that their ministry is three and a half years, and they're to be clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth just means a, a sacks that they would put grain in. And they would cut a, a hole for the head and two holes for 
for the arms and they would wear this. Say, why would they wear that? Because sackcloth has always been a sign of humility and of repentance and humbling oneself before almighty God and before people. And they'll be calling on Israel primarily to repent. Now look at verse four. And when the seven, I'm sorry, verse four, uh, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now you might wonder, what does that mean? What does that possibly mean? Well, when it says they're, that they're called the two olive trees, the two candlesticks, it's a reference back to the Old Testament book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 4, I'll read it for you, verses 11 to 14. Zechariah 4, 11 to 14. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side and the candlestick and uh, of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So here is an Old Testament prophecy. And we see again the fulfillment of that in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, which is yet to come. And so these two prophets are prophesied of old. Look at verses 5 and 6. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Who are these two witnesses? Who can they possibly be? Well, they're not named. So we don't know, do we? We don't know who they are. Some people speculate and say it could be Moses and could be Elijah. How about that? Because these were two mighty men of old and men of miracles and great preaching. They say Elijah never died. They say, uh, and what happened to Moses' body? We don't know. It's, it's a mystery. And they say Elijah called down fire from heaven. And so they say it could be Moses and Elijah. Others say, no, it's probably Elijah and Enoch. Enoch, because Enoch never died. And uh, the Bible says it's appointed on a man once to die. Every man needs to die. Will it be Elijah and Enoch or Moses and uh, Enoch or Moses and Elijah? We don't know. We don't know who these two witnesses are. We don't know. It's, they're not named. But we don't have to know. In verse 7, it goes on. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. That's a reference to the Antichrist shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, as you probably know, the Antichrist makes his big appearance at the beginning of the tribulation. Many of us think he's in the world today, gaining power, gaining recognition, prestige, gaining political pull, gaining everything he needs. And when the time is right and the rapture happens and he's there on the forefront, and he spearheads the signing of the seven-year peace treaty with Israel. The whole world will know, I think, who it is. But this Antichrist, whoever it is, is killed halfway through the tribulation. And he comes back to life. Now, my personal take on it is that when he's killed, his soul goes to hell. And when he's raised back up, it's the devil who raises him and puts a demon inside of his body because he is a changed man between when he was uh, alive the first three and a half years and then died. And now this second three and a half years, he is a changed individual. He's not the same. And so he comes back and now he kills, he makes war with the two witnesses and he kills them. And uh, I think that many people will believe in the antichrist after that. 
Many people will say, well, here, uh, no one could defeat those two witnesses. No one was able to do it. And look at all the plagues they brought upon the world. And we hated them. We tried killing them, but every assassin himself died. No one was able to kill these two. And here comes, and I'll just use the word antichrist, but here comes the antichrist. They won't call him that, I'm sure. But here comes the antichrist. And he died, he came back to life, and he overcame these two witnesses. He must be some kind of God. And of course, as you know, the Antichrist will start demanding worship. And so, we have verse um, verse 8, where they're dead bodies. Here, it says they're dead bodies of the, the two witnesses shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, which also, uh, where our, also our Lord was crucified. That tells us what the city is. The city is Jerusalem. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. You know, until the invention of satellite TV, it was impossible for the whole world to see something all at once. But today, satellite TV coupled with the internet makes it a common occurrence to see things as they happen anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. And leaving their dead bodies in the streets is like how someone might display the dead body of a terrible criminal. They didn't suffer their bodies to be to be buried and put away, but they left them there on display. Benito Mussolini was a wicked man who controlled Italy for 21 years, and he led his country to ruin. In 1940, he joined forces with Adolf Hitler. Quickly, Mussolini became a very much hated man by the Italian people. And at the end of the war, as he tried to flee and escape, he was captured and he was shot to death. He and his wife on April the 28th, 1945. Mussolini's body, along with a few others, were hung up for display upside down on meat hooks at an Italian gas station. Crowds of angry Italians came by and would spit on the bodies. They threw rocks at the dead bodies. Sometimes they took guns and shot those dead bodies to display their anger. Finally, at the end, their bodies were taken down. Hitler being made aware of this took his own life two days later on the 30th of April, 1945 and left instructions that his body and that of his, his mistress whom he had married right before they committed suicide, they were to be incinerated and burned. Well, this seems to be sort of the reaction of the world toward the two witnesses. They hate the witnesses because of all of the plagues brought upon them. And we'll be studying more of those plagues as we get more into the book of Revelation. And verse 10, they're having parties. If you'll see once again, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So for a couple of days, the unsaved world will have its party. They'll celebrate the death of these two witnesses. I'm sure that when they crucified our Lord for two or three days, the world had its celebration. Parties, banquets, happiness, gift giving, speeches, orations, Celebrations of all kind will go on around the world. Why? Because these two witnesses would have stopped it from raining upon the earth. These two witnesses would have turned the waters into blood. These two witnesses would have called for plagues. And the world hated them with a passion. They would have felt tormented. The entire world felt tormented physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, spiritually. They may have thought that all of the world's problems are caused by these two Jewish witnesses. And so verse 11, 
And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet. Watch. And great fear fell upon all, upon them which saw them. Imagine the scenes of great happiness in, amongst the unsaved. And then all of a sudden, they view the bodies, the dead bodies that had been lying there. And maybe had been filled with bullets as well. We don't know. Suddenly these bodies come back to life. These two men stand up on their feet. What fear, what dread, what horror would have gone through the hearts and minds of people seeing this, witnessing this. And then instantly around the world via the internet, people seeing, oh no, they're back to life. They're going to come after us. We're all going to die. <clears throat> Still, the world is not ready to repent. The world yet is not ready to fall on its knees and get right with God. Oh, what will it take? These days we're going through a bad plague. Coronavirus has gone around the world. It's not done yet. It's going to get worse. Over 600,000 have gotten the, uh, the illness. Over 26,000 or 27,000 have died. It's absolutely incredible what's happening. I talk to people and they say, it's like a dream. How can this be happening? It's like a Hollywood movie. And yet it's happening. And I believe it is preparatory for the tribulation yet to come. But still, where's the revival? Where are the news reports of people that are falling on their knees and getting right with God? We're not hearing it, are we? I sure hope they... They come. I sure hope it happens. I do with all my heart. My heart's desire is for folks to be saved. Particular in our city of Surrey. 600,000 people. Need to hear the gospel. They need to know. That there's a savior. They need to know that their sin is taking them to hell. They need to repent. And come to the savior. Before it's too late. You know something. These two witnesses came back to life. Boom boom. All of the world got crazy and scared once again. They didn't fall on their face and get right with God. Do you remember reading in Luke chapter 16 about the rich man and Lazarus? And the rich man died and left all his ill-gotten gains behind him. And he went clothed in rags into the pit of hell. And there he is today, by the way. And shortly thereafter, he was able to see... Across this great gulf, Abraham and that beggar, that Lazarus beggar guy with Abraham. And he called out and he said, Father Abraham. You remember the conversation they had back and forth. And one of the arguments, one of the logical thoughts of the rich man was for Abraham to send Lazarus back to the land of the living. So that he could talk to his five brothers. He had five brothers. And he didn't want his five brothers to end up there. I wonder how many people in hell today. Are hoping. That someone go speak to their brothers. Their sisters. Their mothers and their fathers. I wonder how many there are. The rich man thought. That if someone came back to life. Then his five brothers would repent. And get right with God. Abraham said it's not going to work that way. They have, they have the Bible. They have Moses and the prophets. They got the scriptures. That's what they need. The rich man said, essentially, he said, my brothers don't read the Bible. My brothers don't go to church. My brothers don't listen to preaching. My brothers tear up gospel tracts. Too bad. Too bad. Here we have two of the greatest preachers the world will ever, ever see. Preach for three and a half years. They die. They come back to life. And the world still doesn't get right with God. Look at verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. And their enemies beheld them. Some people seem to think that the church is going to go halfway through the tribulation period and then be raptured up to heaven. And they base it upon this. 
It's called a mid-tribulational rapture position. It means the Christians will be raptured halfway through the tribulation. I don't believe that because I believe you have to depart from the normal, common sense, literal, grammatical method of interpreting the Bible, the scriptures. And you have to start making it say things it doesn't say in order to come up with that. In the last few years, another popular position has been the pre-wrath. It's very similar to mid-trib. They just changed the words a little bit. But essentially, it's a similar concept. I don't believe it. These two men do not represent the church. Some people think that these two men represent the church. And at the halfway point, they're raptured up to heaven. You see, that's what will happen, they say. The church will go halfway through the tribulation and it'll be raptured up to heaven. Oh, my friend, you really have to put on rose-colored sunglasses to come up with that. You really have to change the scriptures to come up with that, that interpretation. You need to depart from the normal, natural, common sense, literal, grammatical method of understanding the details of the Bible and the scriptures in order to make this one fit. You have to use a spiritual method, making things say things that they don't say and, and saying that they're symbolic. For example, if the two witnesses represent all of the saved people at that point in the world, what are we talking? 500 million? Are we talking a billion? How many people are we talking about? And the question is, where are these 500 million or 1 billion located? The Bible says that these two witnesses are in Jerusalem. In verse 8, we saw that. I know where a literal, literal Jerusalem is. I've been there. I can find it on a map. I know where it's at. I do not know what a spiritual Jerusalem is, nor do I know where it's at. And consequently, those who believe in a mid-tribulational doctrine must now say that Jerusalem is actually the entire world because that's where all 500 million or a billion Christians will be located. They won't be in any actual city. They'll be all over the world. Well, listen, as of 2020, the population of Jerusalem is about 930,000. It's getting up to a million. It won't hold 500 million. It won't hold a billion. And these who spiritualize the scriptures and believe in a mid-tribulational position and they base it upon the two witnesses representing the church. Well, it can't possibly be in Jerusalem. So they have to now say that Jerusalem represents the whole world. But if we do that, we cause another problem. Because now if the whole world is Jerusalem, what do we do in chapter 18 of Revelation with Babylon? Because what does Babylon represent then? If Jerusalem is called a holy city and the whole world has to be Jerusalem, is the whole world a holy place? Is the whole world a holy city? Absolutely not. It's a wicked place. What do you do with Babylon then? Where can Babylon be? Maybe it's up on Mars or something like that. You see, you run into problems. You got another problem also in verse 5 the, concerning the two witnesses. It says, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Since when does fire proceed out of the mouth of Christians? Oh, well, it's spiritual fire. And it kills? It kills them? You see how you have to keep changing your lies and changing things and changing things to make it fit. Wait a minute. If we have to spiritualize the killing in verse 5, then we have to spiritualize the killing in verse 9 too. Because it says that the witnesses, the two witnesses will be killed. So now we have to spiritualize that. They're not really killed. They're just spiritually killed. What does that even mean? Their dead bodies lie for three and a half days. What does that mean? 
Well, apparently anything you want it to mean, I guess. When you start going around and messing with the word of God. How can 500 million or a billion Christians be spiritually killed and lie for three and a half spiritual days in spiritual Jerusalem all over the world? I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. It's far better to simply believe what God has written. Amen? Somebody type in amen. We come to the very end. Verse 13, and at the same hour, there was a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell. Now that city is Jerusalem. It doesn't mean all over the world. It means Jerusalem. It says a tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. 7,000 literal men. Count them. And the remnant. Ooh. Now this is looking good. The remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Ha. We're getting somewhere now. The death of these two witnesses was not in vain. It's bringing about the redemption of Israel. Amen. Listen, every Christian needs to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You need to be a witness for Jesus Christ, my friend. And you can do it from your home, with your telephone, with your internet. You can do it from your balcony window. I know we're supposed to keep social distancing these days. I know that. Six feet, they say. Well, you can talk to someone six feet away. You can encourage them. You can leave a gospel tract and back away and they can come and pick it up. There's many things that you can still do. But I want to give you four simple words that might help you. Number one, care. Show concern for unsaved people. You need to show concern for them and their plot in life. They don't have Christ. They don't have a hope. They don't have a joy in them. You need to care. Number two, prayer. You need to pray about them. Don't discount the the effectiveness of your prayer when it comes to preparing people's hearts to receive the good news of the gospel. Number three, you need to dare. What do we got here? We got care, prayer, and we got dare. It takes a little courage to witness to people and to tell them they need to be right with God. Because there are days of tribulation coming. They need to be right with God. For their, the sake of their own soul. If you've got close friends. Family. Relatives. You need to dare. Listen. I was a young Christian back in 1975. I'd only been saved a short time. <laughs> but I knew right from wrong. It was my uncle Hilliard. He was an elderly gentleman. He'd been in and out of the hospital. He was in the hospital again, quite serious. I went in to visit him. The Holy Spirit told me to witness to him. To tell Uncle Hilliard about Jesus. And I resisted. And I says, no, uh, it's not the right time. I'll wait till he gets better and goes home. And then I'll go to his home. And then I'll, I'll tell him the gospel. And I felt good about myself, my decision. A couple days later, I got the news. Uncle Hilliard had passed away. And I carry that burden with me to this very day. I wish I could go back and tell Uncle Hilliard. I mean, what's he going to do? Throw me out of the hospital? Not on your life. But at least I would have had opportunity to share. Listen, that is number four. Share. If you want to make a lasting impression, share yourself with people. Get involved maybe in their interests. Shoulder their burden. These two witnesses, they fulfilled their ministry. And you and I also have a ministry to fulfill. And we can serve God in many ways still in these last days. We can serve God in many ways. And we can be good witnesses. And these two witnesses were good witnesses and they were called up to heaven. And one day you and I will be called up to heaven and we'll stand before Jesus and you too can say that you did your best. We're going to have a word of prayer. And very soon we're going to have our offertory. And I want to encourage you please to give by faith. Our bus ministry is on hold and so all of our offerings that come in are going in 
to help our general fund. Accept our faith promise for our missionaries. Please don't let your missionaries starve. We need to support these missionaries. Please be faithful with your faith promise. But be faithful with your tithes and offerings. You'll have an opportunity to do that in just a moment. We're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to show you that little devotional. I'm sorry, that little donation video. And after that, we'll have a time for offering. Please honor the Lord with your substance. Honor him. He will honor you. Pray with me now.